And I'm actually going to turn it over to Jim right now. We're going to uh, have some comments and reflections from Albert Kligman's friends and colleagues, and I'm going to uh, ask Jim Layden to take over from here. No, I know, but just to introduce everybody as you go. Guy, 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 guy will go? Okay. Yeah, we all know each other. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. yeah, it, it is precarious up there. Uh, Albert Kligman was an amazing man, and I met him as a really impressionable youth. I was 19 years old, uh, a freshman at Penn, and I somehow ended up with Jim through a story that's far too long to tell, but you've probably all heard it four or five times anyway, <laughs> at least six. Uh, and, and Albert was astounding. He was frightening. He was a force of nature. Uh, he was, at that time when I met him, the age that I am now. And it astounds me the energy that he had at 54, because I sure as heck don't have it. And he was compelling. He was exciting. He, was, he sought out bullshit with every fiber in his body and attacked it. Uh, he hated fakery. He hated posers. Hmm? Well, don't go there. Uh, he was just an amazing guy. And as I grew older and got to know him better, it was amazing to be around him. It was um, stimulating. And I'll leave it to people who know him better than I to continue. Well, Albert started his, his laboratory in 1951. I started my residency in 1951. And I've been trying to think how Albert and I really got together, because I was his first real fellow who spent full time with him. And as I think about it, it probably was in relation to tinea capitis, which was an epidemic in Philadelphia at that time. And every Friday morning in clinic, Albert ran a clinic in which he saw maybe 20 to 30 young children with tinea capitis, and most of them were subjected to uh, radiation in the scalp. And I was assigned to that clinic with Albert, and I had the opportunity to see him during that clinic. And Albert is often said to have been the uh, person who really developed the uh, SID. I think that's wrong, because I think there were others like Stephen Rothman and Marion Sulzberger who, and, and Naomi Kanoff and Herman Bierman, who were very important in the beginning of the SID. But what Albert really did was he developed translational research. And translational research is a buzzword of the day, but really it began with Albert, because Albert would look at the disease and study the disease and look very carefully at the patient. He didn't need anything other than his eyes and his brain to get organized. And I still think up to this day, any of the younger people in the audience to look at Albert's initial patients on tinea capitis, because they're just beautiful pieces of work based upon simple observation. And Albert had lots of, those were, those were funny days at that time. Those were days when Albert rode to work on a Cushman scooter with a top hat on. Uh, they also were the days where, believe it or not, Albert flew a plane. And actually, I flew with Albert twice. Uh, I felt like the eight-year-old child in the, uh, in the control tower at Kennedy Airport. Because Albert got up there, he took his hands off the wheel and said, fly the plane. I think he was studying hyperhidrosis at the time, uh, to tell you the truth. There, Albert was, uh, was an unbelievable person in terms of of educating the, the fellows. He was dedicated to the young people. I, I can tell you one thing. When you went to the SID at that time, there were three pe people who sat in the front row. Uh, Marion Sulzberger, Stephen Rothman, and Albert Kligman. And you could always count on critical comments from the three of them. But it was very nice to present patients uh, present things at the SID and at least have Albert on your side. And there were times when Albert wasn't on your side, but it wasn't to the youth of the, of the specialty, it was to the elders. I can remember a meeting where at one point Albert was, uh, was chastising Franz Herman from New York 
for this feedback theory related to sebaceous gland secretion. And any of you who knew Franz Her Herman, and there aren't many other than, than this guy right here, who knew, who knew him, but he was, uh, he was trying to give up smoking and he had a fake cigarette. And when Albert commented to him about how stupid the feedback theory was, uh, Franz Herman bit through, completely through his <laughs> artificial cigarette. There are many, many stories I could tell about those early days with Albert. Uh, it's, it's got a very definite impression when I think that I was his first Rio fellow. Uh, the next Rio fellow that he had was Bill Epstein, who came in 1953. Uh, uh, and I, I think of all the people who trained under Albert, who, was, uh, who are sitting here up at the top of the stage, Al, Alan was not actually with him, but was in, was in, uh, had lots of training with him. Uh, he was an unbelievable person in his contributions to this society, uh, to all of dermatology, were really unreal. If there's time a little later, I'll make some more comments. Actually, I'd, I'd like to just acknowledge a couple of the, uh, the a lifelong uh, co-author with Albert of, of two versions of what I think is one of the best books ever written about acne, uh, Professor Gert Playwig. Gert, are you still here? And, and also one of your other colleagues uh, that trained together with Jim and Gert, Jim Fulton, is here somewhere in the room oh, where he was. Oh. Is he gone? Well, anyhow. Um, I, well, that's, that's a picture of Albert and, and me. Uh, Albert is one of only two people that we invited every single year to come give grand rounds in my department. The other is Gene Bologna, and I think you could guess why. Uh, but it was truly an inspiration. I first met Albert uh, when I was an undergraduate at Brown University. At that time, his, one of his closest friends was my professor of biology, Bill Montagna, who used to run the Brown University Symposium on the Biology of Skin which is still now run now as the Montagna Symposium in, in Oregon uh, at Salishan Lodge. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, Montagna was a great inspiration as a teacher. Uh, and I got to work with him my senior year, and he put me to work on sebaceous glands. So that was my, my first interest in skin biology. Uh, but Albert came to this meeting, which was uh, the Brown University Symposium on the Biology of Skin on Sebaceous Glands and Acne. And I can tell you, he was an absolute wild man. He, he had bushy, curly hair, right, in those days. John, I think, had just finished his residency. Peter wasn't yet involved. Uh, all the giants, Marion Salzberg and Stephen Rothman. But, but Albert stood up on top of one of the laboratory benches, because that's where we had it. And he would talk about sebaceous athletes. He had a way of exaggerating that made it sound simple uh, and logical. Uh, and then I didn't see him for a couple of years. I was supposed to go to Penn Medical School, but he was being sued by the Dean of Law School because he flew his plane underneath the George Washington Bridge. Uh, uh, yeah, he really did. <laughs> he was, it was very severe fog, and he couldn't see the river. He was following the Hudson River. Uh, and he, so we tried to stay as close to the river as possible. And but he wound didn't up, land in the river. No, <laughs> no, he didn't land in the river. But... Uh, the next most memorable event, I was, uh, I was drafted and I was in the U.S. Navy up in Jacksonville. Uh, <clears throat> and they gave me permission to go to an SID meeting. And I was, let's say, sitting where you are, Diane, on an aisle seat. And let's say the microphone is where that bar is. And Albert was in that brief interlude when he was interested in photobiology. Uh, and he was presenting a paper. And Tom Fitzpatrick got up to criticize the paper. Albert had next to Sam Schuster, the most incredible command of the English language of anybody I knew. And he proceeded to tear Tom Fitzpatrick, who was you know, quite a distinguished figure in American dermatology. He tore him to shreds. And all I could see from that seat behind him was that Fitzpatrick's back of his neck was getting redder and redder until it was the color of the wine in your, your glass. Uh, when I was a resident uh, at NYU, although Actually, Don Pillsbury offered me a residency because uh, 
because his son-in-law was a neurologist at uh, Wake Forest when I was a medical student. Uh, but uh, Simone didn't want to move anymore. She'd already moved four times. Uh, so we, we came back to New York. But at any rate, uh, <clears throat> Albert let me come down to Penn, uh, introduced me to Jim and Garrett and, and, and Jim Fulton uh, because they had an acne clinic and I wanted to see how they did lesion counts. Uh, he also had, used to have a journal club where he would get daily sandwiches. Uh, and so I would be able to come down to that periodically. And, and we stayed in touch uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, he's always been helpful and critical. Uh, and more recently, he told me he couldn't get Jewish food in Philadelphia anymore. So I would send him care packages from Zabar's in New York. And uh, he really appreciated it. But I don't think Laurie liked me doing that. So <laughs> I wasn't able to contact. But anyway, he was a major influence in my career. And I think there's one other photograph that I wanted to show before. Uh, we go. Yeah, that's, uh, Who's that? I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, another, another one of the disciples. So anyhow. Uh, James, it's all yours. We, we, didn't, we didn't know that Gerd Playwig was going to be here when we uh, decided to do this at the very last minute when Albert passed away just you know, r relatively recently. So Gerd, would you like to come up and say a few words? Gerd, Gerd and I started on the, on the same day many years ago. And take your time. You're getting a little older. And <laughs> Nasty, nasty, nasty boys you are. <laughs> well, Albert Kligman accepted me in 1967, and we were 11 sons, you know, research fellows from all over the world. Two of them were kicked out the very first day, <laughs> incompetent. And he was not so gentle in the beginning because he didn't know who we were, and we didn't know who he was. He was sitting in a little room uh, like a a cockpit in an airplane, just two chairs, a chivel chair there. And uh, Adele Allen was his secretary. She was a lovable person. She said, Doctor, your fellows need an increase in money. $250 a month is not enough. So, Albert, why don't we pay them more? So, Adele helped us to pay. And there was a liquor cabinet with Dr. Jack Daniels. And the bottles were empty overnight, but not because of us, because of the night guards who knew what was in there. When I left Albert and returned to Germany, and of course we came back every year for 43 years to stay with him and Laurie, he wrote me once, "Good, there is no hope for you. I said, what's wrong with me? And he said, you're not married, you will not find a woman. Then I ran, sent him a letter, said, Albert, I found a woman, I'm getting married. He said, I don't believe you. I want to see the dotted line signed by you. <laughs> so I said, I bring the paper and my, my bride, my wife, and Helga, and I came on a sunny afternoon in September, knocked at the door in Love Ladies Harbor on the beach. And there was Albert and Laurie. And Albert said hello to us. And then he said immediately to Helga, Helga, let's go swimming. And Laurie screamed. She said, Albert, cut it out, because Helga was not aware of what he was meaning. He said, I'm going swimming in the nude. So my wife stripped right there, took everything off she had on, went swimming to the lagoon with Albert, and she was accepted immediately into the family. <laughs> yeah. I can tell stories like this for a thousand nights. Wonderful memories, Albert's visits to um, parts of the world, to Germany, and he always had funny requests. He had three requests at one visit. I want to eat wild boar. I want to sleep in a castle. And I want to visit the crazy King Ludwig's castles in Bavaria. And we did all of this. Albert was fascinating. And uh, I will finish with one last story. We took him to Bayreuth, the festival city, and we were listening to the Flying Dutchman. And we were clad in, we had tuxedos on, it's a very fine society. 
and Albert had a single seat in the first, second row maybe, and Laurie and Helga and I were sitting a little further back. And Albert was moving during the uh, performance with his arms, and the neighbors said, calm it down. He was so excited about the artistic performance of uh, the Flying Dutchman from, by Wagner. Albert was a man, not only uh, a giant in science and humanities, but he was interested in art. He knew so much about all these things, and he loved also to eat and drink. He did not discern between good wines, Jim. It was only pharmacology for him. <laughs> but he had his Dr. Jack Daniels at 6 o'clock in the afternoon. He started drinking. At 5 o'clock, the glasses were put up on the counter, and uh, we had to wait for one hour. So I could go on for hours with these stories. We will miss you, Albert. Thanks, Gary. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on for hours with some more stories. <laughs> Another glass? Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's start with his name, Albert Montgomery Kligman. Uh, after I got to know him well enough, I asked him one day, you know, what, Montgomery, is that a family name or something like that? And he said, no, actually, uh, when he joined the faculty, uh, he was living on Montgomery Avenue in the Montgomery Apartments, and one of his buddies in the hospital who was from the main line said, look, Albert, if you're going to make it out here, you've got to have Roman numerals after your name, <laughs> or at least a middle name. So he said, uh, Montgomery, Albert Montgomery Kligman had a nice ring to it, <laughs> and he became Albert Montgomery Kligman uh, because uh, of that, that advice. Now, as many of you know, he was born on St. Patrick's Day, and most of you probably do not know, because unless you're Irish, uh, that if uh, people born on St. Patrick's Day who do not have Celtic uh, DNA, God randomly assigns uh, Irish traits to individuals. And uh, Albert got a handful. He got, he got Irish luck. He got command of the English language so he could speak and write like the great Irish poets and playwrights and authors. And he got the, per, the personal characteristics of generosity, uh, fierce loyalty, uh, and wit. He, his beginning was very, very humble. He tells the story about his birth. He said, my mother was not the smartest woman. She was a lovely woman, but not very smart. She, she thought she was having a bowel movement when she delivered me. <laughs> and, he, uh, as Gerd said, he loved, he, you couldn't sit with him at, and have dinner. If you turned to say something to someone, you turned back, your plate was empty. Because he, he grew up hungry, and he never forgot it. And he, uh, if there was food, he would eat it. Uh, and he was a quirky kid. There's no other way of putting it. He was a little strange. And I remember him telling me, he said, you know, they put me in a class for retarded kids. So they didn't call him special educational, they just called me retarded. And, and uh, he said, uh, by the time he was about eight or nine, they, they figured out he might be smart and he was just bored. Um, and it, it was the Boy Scouts that saved him. He became a Boy Scout, Eagle Scout, and that gave him a, a, a sense that he, he could uh, be uh, accomplished, at least in some areas. And he became a great athlete, he was the cross country high school cross country champion in Philadelphia two years. He was a great gymnast, he made the Olympic team. He didn't compete because he broke his, his wrist, otherwise he would have competed, I think it was the 32 Olympics. So uh, to give you an idea of his luck, he, he became a, a, a botanist, he was a specialist in mushrooms. Uh, there's actually a, a major textbook many years ago that was dedicated to him because of his pioneering work. Uh, in, in that area, and the luck was that we were involved in a war that didn't look like it was going to end. The war in, in the Far East didn't look like it was going to end, so they basically rounded up PhDs and put them in medical schools to put them on a fast track to become uh, medical, medically qualified, because they figured we were going to need a lot of doctors for a long period of time. So he was one of the guys rounded up and uh, was at Penn Medical School for this uh, rapid uh, medical education. And when he finished, the war was over. <laughs> so uh, 
So what was he going to do? And someone said, well, you know, you're a, you're a mushroom, a fungus guy. You know, why don't you look into dermatology? So by luck, he met Don Pillsbury, who was a man of vision and great tolerance. As Albert has said, probably Pillsbury's greatest contribution to dermatology was not to get rid of him. <laughs> because he was, he was a little wild, a little difficult, and John can, has some interesting, interesting stories on, on that regard. So there he was. Uh, as a second year resident, those of you who are in dermatology, he described the PAS stain for fungi as a resident. You know, that's a minor contribution. Um, and, and he was the right person at the right time. He had this, this person with this tremendous intellectual curiosity and, and boundless uh, energy. He was like a kid in a candy store. You know, he just run everywhere he looked, there was something that, that, re that all you had to do was ask a couple of questions and make a couple of observations. And it was the first time anybody had ever uh, uh, done almost, he did so many things, it, it, it was, it's, it's hard, hard to imagine. I'll tell you a story or two about his, uh, command of the English language, as, as John said, he at the SID was famous for destroying people if they presented something that was not uh, logical. Or, uh, and, but what many of you don't know, I know some of you know, because you've told me uh, this, that he used to send out little letters all his life to people. He'd read a paper or hear somebody give a talk, and he'd send out a little note encouraging them, telling how much he liked it sometimes offering suggestions of other experiments to do. Always had an invitation, if you're ever in Philadelphia, please come visit me, and, and many people did. So he was, he was very, very uh, uh, generous uh, that way. Uh, very early, I learned his tell. You know, those of you who play cards know it. If you can learn people you're playing with their tell, you can tell when they're faking or lying or uh, bluffing. And I learned his I learned his tell when when he was when he was uh, 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 you know not exactly <laughs> telling the truth or exaggerating which he did a lot of he used his voice would go up and he'd start waving his hands and then when he was slinging it really slinging it he would he would pound the table so one time he one day he was really slinging it. We were discussing something, and so I just stopped him. I said, "I'm going to ask you something, and don't take this personally. You never did that experiment, did you? You just know that's the way it is." And he kind of looked at me and he said, "You know, I don't think I ever did that, but God damn it, that's the way it is." You know, and he pounded <laughs> pounded the table. Uh, one thing you might not know, he he gave such great talks. Is he was actually terrified of giving a talk. And one of my roles for many years was to get him ready for talks. And I spent many a time at this meeting in his room. Usually he was in the bathtub, uh, and I'm showing him slides, and he's saying, what do you think if I say this, or if I do that? And then he'd get up, and all his talks began by, he'd pick on somebody. And, and usually it was fairly funny. And as soon as the audience would laugh, he completely relaxed. And then he could give the most the most uh, uh, amazing, amazing talks. So he was very, very generous to all of us who worked with him. He pushed, he pushed us out in the limelight very, very quickly. And I'll just tell you one or two stories where that didn't work out so well for me. Um, uh, but I learned quickly. He once asked me, he said, you know, I want you to go with me tomorrow to New York. The, the, we're gonna, there's a uh, industry meeting these people have to design uh, studies for over-the-counter antifungal drugs, and they, we, they want me to answer some questions, and maybe you should come along. They might ask a technical question or two, and, uh, that I, and you can be helpful. So we walk into this room at LaGuardia. There are 400 people sitting there. And this guy comes up to Albert, and he says, uh, Dr. Kligman, if you give me your slides, I'll put them in the carousel. And he looks at me and says, what the hell are you talking about, slides? I don't have any slides. This guy goes white, you know. <laughs> and uh, he introduces Albert, he gets up, and, and he says, you, you know, as I'm thinking of this, why should I give this talk when I have with me my junior associate who actually did all the work? Uh, 
<laughs> and I, with that, I'll turn it over. Jim, come up. up. <laughs> this guy now is shaking, and he is his hematocrits below his belly button. And I stand up and look at him. I say, just how long is this? And he said, three hours. <laughs> so uh, I get up, and there's an easel. I said, this would have been a lot easier if I could have had one or two slides, but I'm going to draw. And I recommend we make this fairly interactive, hopefully. Uh, so the, for the first hour, Albert was the, asking the questions. I'd say something. He'd say, no, that's really interesting. So we're having this conversation for about an hour, just the two of us. And there are these people sitting there waiting to be told how they're going to do these, these clinical trials. So as I say, I learned that very quickly. Whenever he asked me to go somewhere with him, I automatically called wherever he was going and said, what do you expect him to do? You know, and he twice, two other times he got there. He says, "I don't think I should give this talk," and he turned it over to me. But I, but I was ready. And and the the best one all was we were gonna we were involved in a symposium for the Society of Cosmetic Chemists, and we're, I'm on the train, you know, doing his slides, and he's no, I don't like that one. Give me another. We get about five minutes from New York, and he says, let me see your slides. We're, this is supposed to be a symposium, Albert, uh, Norman Ortrike, and me. And I show him three slides. He says, what the hell are you doing? Three slides. You know, you're going to embarrass me. You, you, you can't do this. You know, I said, I, there are complicated slides, and they'll take you know, eight to 10 minutes each. Uh, I'll be fine. So we get up there. Norm, and we're supposed to, it's a two-hour symposium. We're each supposed to talk for. Uh, 40 minutes, 30 minutes would leave some time for questions. And Norman Eintracht gets up and talks for one hour and five minutes. Now, Albert and Norman were always very competitive. You think he's going to let him get away with that? He talked for one hour and 10 minutes. So we are now 15 minutes into the, co the, uh, the, the cocktail reception. And there are a lot of people in that audience that needed a drink uh, pretty bad. And, and there I am, being introduced. And so I got up and I said, I had a feeling this might happen. And I brought three summary slides. And I'm not going to say a word. And I just showed the slides you know, for 10, 15 seconds each. And then, and then I said, thank you very much. I, standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, he was a, 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 an amazing, amazing person to be, to be around. And as I've. I've told many people over the years, I've never worked a day in my life. Uh, being with Albert was, was just, every, couldn't wait every day, because every day was, was fun. And I think it summed up best uh, at the very end of his very active uh, involvement. We were at the FDA, supposed to be there for a two-day meeting. After the first day, it was so painful he said, well, where are you going to have dinner? Let's go eat dinner. I said, I'm going home. I'm having dinner with Claudette. I called her. I'm going home. I'm not staying here tomorrow for more of this stuff. And he said, that's a great idea. Let's go. So we, we just left. We didn't even tell him we were leaving. We were on the train, and about halfway between Baltimore and Wilmington, he's looking out the window, and I'm, and I'm thinking, I wonder what he's thinking about. And I was about to ask him, because he was obviously in deep thought about something. I thought maybe, you know, be another insightful breakthrough. Then he turned to me and he said, we had a lot of fun, didn't we? And I said, we had a lot of fun. And uh, that's the way I always remember. It, 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 was, it was just a joy to, uh, to be with him. And we all had a lot of fun, don't you all agree? So with that, uh, we'll move. Do we have enough time for the program, or should we just call it a night? <laughs> <laughs> I have a few summary slides. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, Alan just reminded me, the one Irish trait, and Gerd brought it up, the one Irish trait he was not given was the ability to tell the difference between okay whiskey and really good stuff. I did a double-blind... A tasting study with him once with Jack Daniels, which, you know, which is okay. And 24-year-old Jameson, you know, Irish whiskey, he absolutely could not tell the difference. Uh, and, and I said, I said, it's impossible. <laughs> You're Irish. <laughs> but uh, you can't tell that? He absolutely could not tell it.